I'm back on Plenary Session Video Edition in the new Plenary Session Studio with lots of things above my head. I'm joined by Mani Moyudin. He's an assistant professor at the University of Utah Huntsman Cancer Center. He's a multiple myeloma expert. He's a friend of the show, and uh, everyone loves Mani. Mani, it's a pleasure to see you. Thank you for having me here, Vinay. I'm very small in the frame, and you're very big, and uh, that's how it ought to be. That's how it ought. To be. No, 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 that's good. I like, I like the close, the close-up view. That's what the, that's what the crowd craves. So, Mani. Um, you know, we've been getting ourselves into trouble. We have this new paper coming out. And uh, at the time of this recording, it should be out. So people should be able to read it. So why don't you tell us what is this paper and, uh, and, and, uh, and, what, what, and, and, and what people should know about it. Let's talk about it. Yeah, that sounds great. So this is a paper titled, you know, Intention to Treat versus Modified Intention to Treat Analysis in BCMA and CD19 CAR-T Trials, a Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis. It is published uh, at the European Journal of Cancer. It has an all-star team of authors. You know, the last author is none other than, you know, Vinay Prasad. <laughs> and we also have- uh, That's Aaron. not the most important part. We have some crowd favorites, Aaron Goodman, and yes. then, you know, Al-Ola Abdullah. And then, you know, I want to shout, give a shout out to Tahani, uh, who's a fellow at the University of Kansas, who sort of did a bulk of the work. And Dr. Ahmed, who's a assistant professor at the um, at, at KU and BMT, who did a lot of the work as well. And so I want to give one shout out to Isabel Allen, who came in, she's a UCSF faculty, and came in like uh, Michael Clayton to clean up our mats <laughs> when they needed a stats consult. <laughs> right, there were some complicated stats in there, so we totally do appreciate her help. So, um, you know, what, what we've seen with um, CAR-T is that and it's, it's, it's very exciting technology and, uh, you know, we're seeing uh, pretty high response rates and we're seeing, you know, patient populations that previously were considered incurable now, you know, some of them have had prolonged durable remissions, you know, in the, in the lymphoma space. So it's exciting technology, but the bulk of it or almost all of the trials that we have data for are, you know, uncontrolled single arm studies and the response rates. So first of all, it, you know how they report the response rates is not an intent to treat analysis. And what is an intent to treat analysis? An intent to treat analysis is where you um, you know run an analysis on all of your patients enrolled, and you can attest to this a lot better than I can, Vina, because you obviously know stats better than I do. But that reduces biases and has a more real world. Um, the, the results reflect what is seen in the real world because not all of your patients enrolled are going to end up getting treatment. Not all of them are going to adhere to the recommended treatment. Um, not all of them are going to complete all of the, you know, the cycles or whatever is required of the protocol. So the standard for, for trials is to report uh, an intent to treat analysis. Yeah, let me just add one thing there because I think that's an important point. I guess I would say um, intention to treat has long been the standard, and it's literally asking the question of, among all the people I enroll on this protocol and I, in my heart, wish to treat, how many of them will respond to this therapy, you know, in the uncontrolled setting? And in the randomized setting, intention to treat is super important because the whole reason you're randomizing is you want to equilibrate outcome distributions the best you can and minimize confounding. And intention, and then that's why you're randomizing. And the moment you break away from intention to treat, you are reintroducing the confounding you worked so hard to eliminate with randomization because the people who tolerate treatment and do more of it are different than those who cannot tolerate it and don't get it. And so in randomization, if you're a fool to do a per protocol analysis. And in this setting, I think it's misleading because I can't counsel the person in my office. So I think the intention to treat is key. And that's what you zo zoomed in on in your paper. Right. And uh, so, you know, so for a patient to get CAR-T, um, and hopefully that's changing now, but for a patient to get CAR-T, so first of all, you know, you have to be, you know, very fit and you have to be very eligible, don't have to have a lot of comorbidities. There are long waiting lines at institutions, right, for these trials. So you have to have disease that's sort of stable enough where you don't, you know, need another treatment or you don't pass away while waiting for, um, for your trial slot to open. And then you get on this trial, right? And then there's a, there's a waiting period. So there's a period where you know, you're gonna consent and then there's a period where they're going to collect your cells and something could go wrong in the collection process. Then there's a period where you know, they give you some sort of bridging treatment. Then there's a period where um, you, know, you, you, you get your conditioning and then you finally get um, you know, your CAR-T. So that there's such a long period of time where something could happen and patients do fall off. So the, the, the problem with how the vast majority of CAR-T trials have reported their data is that they only give you the efficacy for the patients who actually got CAR-T. And it's a highly selected patient population 
that goes through all of these hurdles and makes it to actually getting CAR T. And hence you have a highly selected group of patients with probably you know, more indolent biology than your average uh, you know, patient with lymphoma or myeloma that you're seeing. So we sort of wanted to explore this further. So um, you know, the two you know, most important targets in the CAR-T space are CD19. We've had a lot of drug approvals uh, in the lymphoma space. And then BCMA, where we've had a drug approval in the myeloma space and you know, some more coming up. So we wanted to look at all BCMA and CD19 CAR-T trials uh, so we did a systematic review. We looked up several databases, you know, PubMed, Cochrane, um, and uh, basically, you know, found all BCMA and CD19 trials. And then we wanted to ask two important questions. So the first question is, do these trials, um, do they report the number of patients enrolled versus the number of patients that actually went on to receive product? So that's one important question that we asked. The other important question that we asked was, for those trials that do report on the number of patients you know, enrolled versus the number of patients that actually receive product, what is the difference in response rate when you look at when the denominator is the number of patients enrolled versus when the denominator is the number of patients who just got the CAR-T? Okay. So that is the general principle. So that's, you know, we did a intent to treat versus a modified intent to treat analysis. I, so, you know, there are a lot of assumptions that we sort of had to make in this process. Uh -huh. and, um, and you made, I mean, assumptions that give them the benefit of the doubt. Correct, correct. Yes. So what we could have done is that we could have just had the denominator as all enrolled patients, right? So a true intent to treat analysis, but we sort of wanted to do a deep dive and wanted to be fair, right? So, you know, let's say somebody's disease responds completely with conditioning treatment, it completely disappears, or somebody's disease spontaneously regresses, or you know, somebody achieves MRD negativity. These were all reasons for which patients were actually excluded from the, you know, the, yeah, yeah, from the analysis that was reported in um, the CAR-T trial. So what we did is that we did not include those patients in our denominator for our analysis because we thought it would be unfair to consider them as, as non-responders when in reality, they're sort of ward responders. So we did, you know, we, RT, but to other stuff. Exactly, right. exactly. So we sort of, you know, looked at all of these reasons, but uh, the counter argument is they were patients that died, right? So they were patients that had obvious disease progression. They were patients that had obvious complications of disease progression or a patient that died. And then they were simply excluded from the denominator. So your denominator was only, you know, patients that, you know, stayed healthy enough to actually get the CAR-T without dying or progressing. So that's a highly selected group of patients. So we tried to be fair, but it did sort of make the analysis a little complicated. And then the other problem is so often the reasons were not reported, right? So um, it, you, it's, it's very, so, you know, if, if you're not, if you don't know why somebody's being excluded, it's tough for us to sort of make assumptions. So in those cases where it wasn't reported or it was just listed as other, we added them to the denominator in our analysis. So just to summarize two main questions, do trials report the number of patients enrolled versus the number of patients recruited? And then the second question is, for those that do report, what is the difference in response rate between how the studies report it and how we report it when we sort of adjust for the things that I mentioned in the denominator? I see. So this is a very nice summary of what you set out to do. And I guess uh, if I were to say you're, you're trying to ask, um, they're telling you what the response rate is and you're adjusting it for people they have, we feel wrongly excluded, but when there's any doubt, we will err on the side of excluding those people too. Correct, perfect. Okay. So then what do you find? What are the results? Yeah. So we identified a total of 28 BCMA CAR-T trials and 74 CD19 mm -hmm. CAR-T trials. Wow. Amongst the BCMA, let me just talk briefly about the BCMA CAR-T trials first. So 10, so 10 out of the 28, so that's about 35%, actually reported the number of patients enrolled and the number of patients that went on to get CAR-T. So that's like about one third only reported. So for two third, we don't even know how many were enrolled versus how many actually oh, got product. Um, and now for, for those that did report the intent to treat, so, so the intent to treat versus the modified intent to treat analysis. So yeah. it was 78 versus 70%. So they reported 78%, but when we adjusted, we got a response rate of 70%. Mm. So about 8% uh, lower response rates once you adjust for those factors. Okay. Similarly, for CD19, um, 
you know, so CD19, we sort of substratified it in leukemia and lymphoma because they're very heterogeneous diseases. So for CD19 leukemia, um, actually, before I take, I'll take a step back. For CD19 overall, about 70% of trials reported number of patients enrolled versus the number. Better than your BCMA folks. What's going on, myeloma? Right. Well, I think that this, there's, there are more mature results. So CD19 trials have been around for a longer period of time. So you have more manuscripts published and you have longer follow-up. And so you could find I, it someplace. You could find it someplace. Yeah, I could find it someplace. That's correct. That's, the so, That's a nice way to put it. Right. So for, so in, so when it comes, if you're looking at leukemia, um, you know, CD19, the intent, the, the response rate that they reported was 87%. The response rate that we found was 74.9. So, you know, about 75 versus 87, a 12% response rate difference. And for lymphoma, what they reported was 70.7. And what we found was 58.7. So again, a difference of 12%. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in the response. So to summarize, you know, we're finding a, a difference of about eight to 12% in the response rate between a modified intent to treat analysis and an intent to treat analysis. And we also find out that, you know, there the reasons why patients don't receive intended treatment or, you know, the, the actual number of patients enrolled versus the number of patients that got CAR-T are not reported. So there needs to be better reporting and, um, when we have these conversations with our patients in clinic, we probably should give them more realistic numbers and you know, not say that you know, there's an 80 or 90% chance that you're going to respond. So those were the, the highlights of this paper. Wow, that's a great summary. I think it's, uh, it's super interesting. You know, I, um, many years ago, I think I tweeted some slide about the response rate of these products. And if you adjust for intention to treat, and then if you adjust for like durability, um, you know, and I think it's important because when you have that person in your office and they say, oh, 87% response rate, uh, well, that's of people who get collected and live long enough to get the product. That's not maybe where you are right now in your seat. Um, and of course, uh, don't they bill you at the point that they collect the cells, not bill you at the point they give the cells? Is that right? I forget about their billing. They have some way they like to bill for this. Right. Um, but you're saying this is not insignificant, an 8 to 12% response rate. Some of you might say, well, that's not a big deal. Actually, these days with a 12% response rate, you get yourself an FDA approval. <laughs> <laughs> you get yourself a whole approval for that difference. So I think it's uh, important to do. Now, I wonder if you might talk about... Um, you know, I think in the course of doing this project, um, the reason the stats got complicated was that this is kind of a technical issue and people wanted us to disambiguate lymphoma from myeloma, from uh, leukemia, um, but you were able to do that nicely. Anything you learned along the way in doing the project? Because it started out with a little kernel of an idea and you really kind of spun it into a very nice piece, Money, as you right. always do. Oh, as thank you. Yeah, this was, it was quite the undertaking. So, you know, the idea is simple, but it took a lot of effort to, to actually like execute it. And I really appreciate all the help that I got. Um, and I think the, the problem is it's such a, it's such a vastly changing landscape, right? Like we, you know, you and I, we thought of this idea, like about probably it's been like close to a year. Yeah, it's been, it's been a long time. And the problem is that when you intend to do an idea and you conduct the literature search by the time your studies published, the, the landscape has changed. So if somebody were to repeat this today, they might find that reporting has gotten better. And indeed, in some of the newer CAR-T products, I think they have actually reported transparently on the, you know, on, on an intent to treat analysis. So awareness has, has improved, but this was a perfect example of like the effort and the labor and the love you have to put in to sort of translate your idea into, into something real. You know, the peer review comments, um, they were a little harsh at times, but they were also, I think I learned a lot through this. I think I learned a lot of like statistical concepts from this and I appreciate your help and, and Isabel's help in that. Um, and then, you know, it's not, a, it's not a perfect study. So there were situations where, you know, so I tried to look at the actual you know, abstract presentation or the, you know, if it was an oral or if it was a, if, it was, if the poster was available online. But you know you can't always do that, and you know sometimes it's presented at a conference where you can't really like find those slides. So there's a chance that you might it might have been reported somewhere, but it wasn't you know mentioned in the abstract. But I would argue that this is very important information, and you should mention this in your abstract text as well. It's it, it should be something that you know everybody should read. So yeah, there was a lot that I learned through this process, um, and uh, yeah, the landscape is changing. Hopefully, there's better awareness. We're beginning to see some randomized trials you know, roll out some press releases. So we're kind of following up, following up on that. 
Um, but but yeah, it's it's. I think I'm glad that you were able to put a number to it. Yes, uh, I don't uh, put a number to it. Yeah. Right. You know, I call this. This is one of those projects that I like to. I like into a pomegranate. It's like a pomegranate, Manny, because there's fruit in there, but it's a hell of a time to get that fruit out of it. You know, it's a really a hell of a fruit to try to <laughs> eat that fruit. And there's a lot of seed along the way. Uh, but when you can eat it, it tastes delicious. And what you have done, you are that person in the grocery store who's plucked out every little red seed and put it in that nice, easy to eat container. And that's the manuscript, huh? Uh, so this is the pomegranate. So uh, yeah, thanks for doing this work. I great paper it. out now in a great journal, the European Journal of Cancer. It is a great journal. I really like the European Journal of Cancer and uh, Amani Moyudin and colleagues. And, uh, and it's, a, it's a great paper. People should check it out. Thank you for walking us through, Amani. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me.